Hello everyone. My name is Jeff Hahn and I'm facilitating the afternoon webinar series for Corwin. Welcome to What Do I Teach Readers Tomorrow? A moment-to-moment -moment decision making guide with Gravity Goldberg and Renee Hauser. Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Rebecca Eaton from Corwin to introduce Gravity and Renee. Hi. Hi, this is Rebecca Eaton. I'm the Executive Marketing Manager at Corwin Literacy, and I've had the great pleasure of working with Gravity Goldberg and Renee Hauser on marketing uh, their new series, What Do I Teach Readers Tomorrow? There's one for fiction and there's one for nonfiction. Uh, Gravity also has a previous title with Corwin, Mindsets and Moves. And I just want to tell you a little bit about them. They are fabulous people to work with. They are energetic. They are exciting. They are full of new ideas. And they're just they're really quite fun fun to work with. From the start of their collaboration, Gravity and Renee have been deepening their ideas about how teachers make decisions each day. In the years since they worked together as staff developers at Teachers College Reading and Writing Project, they have each gone on to found professional development organizations focused on literacy. Renee's on the West Coast, Gravity's on the East Coast. The constant in all their work is to model for teachers how to develop classroom communities of readers, writers, and thinkers that thrive on student choice and voice. What Do I Teach Readers Tomorrow reflects the author's work in schools, their conversations, and a friendship built upon thousands of miles of swimming, biking, running, and yes, crossing triathlon finish lines together. So I'd like to turn this over now to Gravity and Renee, and thank you everyone so much for attending. We're in for, we're in for a, a good presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. So this is Gravity here, and I'm gonna start us off. Um, you probably will get to hear the differences uh, in the voice. So this is me and Renee, do you wanna say hi? Hi, everyone. Um, so we start um, every presentation and every day with gratitude. So I wanted to start by um, sending some gratitude to everybody who here is joining us live and those of you who will hopefully get to watch this recorded. Um, also want to send some gratitude toward Corwin and of course, my co-author and very dear friend Renee Hauser. Thanks. So the way we're going to be um, structuring our a little bit less than an hour we have together today is we're gonna start off with some theory, but bringing theory into a very practical way around decision-making. We're gonna show you some examples from in um, some of the classrooms that we've worked, and then we're gonna take you really into a classroom with a video, and you'll get to see us um, coaching and conferring with the students. So we'll go from big picture to the sort of minutia details we need as teachers um, working one-on-one -on -one with students. Um, the other thing that's important to maybe talk about is why the books and the webinar is <laughs> call, are called What Do I Teach Readers Tomorrow? So um, coming up with a title for a book is usually a really daunting, hard um, process. Um, that's been my experience. But one of the things Renee and I noticed is we have the privilege of working in classrooms um, many times a week around the country, and we'd often model a lesson. And at the end of the lesson, teachers would say, wow, that was wonderful, but what do I teach tomorrow? <laughs> and we noticed that question was coming up over and over again because we know how much work it takes to decide the answer to that question. And so these series really stemmed from our best attempts to help teachers answer that question of how does today's learning influence tomorrow's teaching? And we're going to give you a, a little bit of a sliver or a slice of what we found. So let's go to the next slide. So the first thing I want to do is ask you, Renee, how many decisions do you think you made today on a regular Monday after a weekend? Okay, so it's Monday. Um, I made a lot of decisions around my commuting pattern, right? Whether or not uh, which, which um, interstate to take. Um, and you could probably say I made decisions about my outfits, or not really though, I often wear the same <laughs> thing every day. Um, what to eat, um, I also allowed myself to think about when to use the bathroom. Um, I also navigated a lot of facial expressions of <laughs> teachers I worked with. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's getting to be, I'm getting to be tired. I'm on my third cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah, so um, 
we know what it's like to make lots of decisions all day. And I've actually never, ever met a teacher who didn't come home at the end of the day utterly exhausted. Even if we're inspired and had one of those amazing teacher days that remind us why we got into this, there's still a level of fatigue. And one of the interesting things we found is there's actually a physiological, real complex called decision fatigue. Like we are not making this up. This is not in our heads that um, when we're asked to make decisions, um, there is a certain breaking point, so to speak, where we literally cannot make another decision. And what the brain does when it gets to that decision fatigue point is it looks for shortcuts. So it's either having somebody else make the decision for us or checking out or just going with the first option that's in front of us. And there's lots and lots of days, probably more days than not, when I get to that point of decision fatigue, and I know so does every teacher I've worked with. And so we often don't call it decision fatigue, even though that's the, the technical term for it um, out of some of the research at, out of Harvard. It might sound more like this, like, I don't have enough time in the day, everyone feels that way, or I have too much to teach, or I have too many resources, I can't possibly look through them all. Or... I have no resources at all, and I have to look everything up and create it all myself. Or I keep reteaching these lessons and they're not getting it. And it creates stress and exhaustion and sometimes anxiety. And we love teachers and want to help with this. Um, selfishly for ourselves, we were interested in this research to how to help ourselves, but also to help the teachers we work with. And so a lot of what we're going to share today um, from our books and in this webinar are some of the ways we can streamline our decisions so we can focus on the decisions that matter most and not the ones that drain us and leave us making poor decisions often later on in the day. Um, like for me, it's that decision of what dessert to eat at the end of the day is always uh, not really thinking about it. It's a habitual, what's the easiest thing to do and it's often cookies, which is not always bad, but I'd like to sometimes have a little more willpower. So one of the things we're gonna ask folks to do is during the time today, to in that chat feature, you can share with Renee and I, and we'll be the only ones who will see it, not everyone will, but what are some of the decisions that you had to make today? And it could be as a teacher, or it could just be a decision that you wanna share that you had to make with us, and we'll share some of those out with the group, especially the ones that are the most interesting or the most uh, surprising to us. You can go to the next slide. Um, in our book, we were, wanting to make quizzes kind of like the ones we read as teenagers and Cosmo and those sort of girl magazines that we would read when we were teenagers and we tried our hand at that and I have to say I have a lot of respect for people who can make those quizzes because it was much harder than we thought. So instead of turning it into a Cosmo or YM style quiz we decided to make them as questionnaires. And the first questionnaire we have early on in chapter one that you can see a screenshot of um, on the slide here it's helping us look at the type of decision makers we are. Because if we're going to try to combat decision fatigue and not be so exhausted, we have to sort of look at our current status. And so the poll we're gonna ask you to take is one of the questions from this um, self-reflection questionnaire. Um, and this is anonymous, so you don't have to out yourself if you don't like the answer. We're looking for honesty here so that we can help you for the whole rest of the webinar um, make the most of those decisions. So let's go to that poll. And I'll read the questions um, and ask everyone to, to sort of have an honest self-assessment. Um, so here they are. So after making your reading instructional decisions, how do you tend to feel? Do you tend to feel A, anxious and worried? Will this really help students? B, like I'm second guessing myself and in need of some colleague support? C, confident my students are getting just what they need next. And if, by the way, you all answer C, then we can just, you know, call it a day and I want to know your secrets. And D, exhausted from all the time it took to decide what students need next. So take a moment to sort of reflect on for yourself when you're deciding what to teach in each moment or in each day, how do you tend to feel? And take a moment to answer that poll, please. And we'll show the results in just a moment as people are, are filling it out. Mm 
Mm, interesting. So it looks like the winner for the most popular vote is B, like I'm second guessing myself and in need of some colleague support. That's probably how I would answer too. And then we have a tie for no answer, which is totally fine because maybe some of you could not make one more decision today. And D, exhausted um, from all the time it took. Um, and this is pretty much exactly what we're finding when we um, work with teachers and we ask them these questions. This very much mimics um, what we're seeing in our conversations with teachers. Renee, did you want to add anything that you're thinking when you see these results? Oh, Renee, are you muted? Yep, I don't know how to get back. Okay. All right, um, there you are. Yep. <laughs> there I am. Sorry. Sorry, thanks about that. Yeah. Um yeah, I feel like I was with uh, the growing ed team today and a lot of us asked that question is am I making the right decision? So it would fall in line with what people are thinking about today with them second guessing. Yeah. So what we're going to share, um, we don't have like the magic bullet, uh, you know, if we did, we would all be like on our yachts that I would be sailing us to our private island. Um, <laughs> you know, if there was a secret answer to not second guessing ourselves as teachers, that's actually, I think, part of what makes us um, so dedicated. But we do want to share with the rest of our time today some things that have helped us to second guess ourselves a little less and feel like we're hitting the target more in those decisions. So let's take them through um, some of our tips and what we found out and our strategies, Renee. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, we are thinking a lot about this question of how do we triumph over decision fatigue? Um, boy, do we make a lot of decisions, Gravity, I thought a lot about it too, right? Like who in our classrooms, who gets to go to the bathroom when, who gets to sit next to who, right? Um, what book should I teach? Somebody just wrote in thinking about uh, a decision they made today of like, is this the best text I can use to teach this? Um, you know, when do I get to go to the bathroom? We once read a study that teachers make up to 2000 decisions a day. So, you know, what's the average? That's a lot of decisions per minute. Um, and so Gravity and I think a lot about this um, all the time. And we, when we were working on looking at some of this um, in the research for this series, we reread Malcolm Gladwell's Blink. And many of you probably read Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, but he popularized this concept of thin slicing. And it became a central metaphor for uh, not only our work in the books, but our work, I think, currently in the field. Um, and this idea of um, Gladwell urges us to think about that we all thin slice in our lives. Um, he refers to a lot of examples in the chapters of the book. One that stood out to Gravity and I as, as uh, athletes is he talks about how um, a tennis coach has the ability to determine the trajectory of a serve in basically a millisecond. And it seems instinctual and almost magical, but Gladwell urges us through a lot of his research that that tennis coach, uh, because they, they've spent hours and hours and hours um, watching tennis and playing tennis, that they're able to be able to make that analysis because they've got a little bit of a gut instinct in them um, and they're leaning on their improvisation a little bit. And so it sounds just like, it is really what it just sounds like. We're taking a thin slice, a small part of something we're working on and we're kind of going with our gut. And when Gravity and I read Blink um, in all the life experiences, we couldn't help but coming back to this idea of this happens in classrooms too. Um, we spend hours and hours in our classroom sitting side by side with students, um, getting to know students, getting to know our colleagues, getting to know our own professional study. And so in a sense, we started thinking about this, bringing this idea of thin slicing um, into our schools. Um, something we think about is that, you know, a lot of our uh, teachers we work with are a little bit overwhelmed with data. Um, you know, sometimes the reality of schools tends to be data rich, information poor. Um, and so that sometimes is daunting and overwhelming and kind of like what Gravity talked about earlier is like sometimes that just we want to back out of decision making then because we're just looking at piles and piles and piles of assessment. And what we're suggesting through the help of an inspiration of Gladwell and other theorists who've made this concept popular is that really 
we want to encourage you to think about assessment as a way of being. Uh, rather than collecting one more piece of paper, not that that paper is wrong, but rather than collecting piles and piles of it and just kind of setting it aside, we really do think that every interaction with students becomes an opportunity to assess them. And when we have those hours of sitting next to kids and listening and talking to them, we're able to use that to, in a sense, get a glimpse, a thin slice, so to speak, uh, and use that information to make a really um, targeted teaching decision so those students are in fact learning. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Renee, I just thought of something and I, you yeah. know, I'm a literacy person, not necessarily a math person, but <laughs> I know that Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours as part yes. of what you need to be able to thin slice. And, and you also mentioned that teachers make about 2,000 decisions a day. So that makes me think that in about five days, <laughs> teachers <laughs> have gotten those 10,000 decisions under their belt. So part of it is just, I think, learning to trust that all the decisions we've made, whether you've been teaching for six months now or six years or 26 years, you know, that you know what your kids need. And that's such an important part of that thin slicing, right, is like trusting our gut and trusting all those hours and experiences that we've had. Absolutely. Nice math work, Gravity. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hopefully that was accurate. <laughs> um, so, let, so with all those hours and thinking that one of our main goals is to cut down or to really be the more strategic in our decision-making process, um, Gravity and I started to look at what it is we were doing in classrooms. You know, so through the story of the title of our book, Gravity mentioned, we spend a lot of time in classrooms. And when people were asking us how, that question, how do you know what to teach next, we started in our conversations together to really study our process along with you all, along with the teachers we were studying. And one thing that Gravity and I like to do is we like to put systems on things. So we started to look at the patterns that were coming up in our teaching. And we came up with this four-step uh, decision-making process that we have found has kind of created some consistency um, in our teaching. And one less decision to make, how to make our decisions, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So if you take a look at what you see on the slide here, um, to make it really quick and easy to remember, we think of it as look, listen, identify, and decide. Because reading is invisible, we thought about how can we make reading visible to ourselves. Um, and so we thought about if one of the steps could be looking at what kids are doing in their reading notebooks or on their sticky notes that reveal the thinking work that kids are doing in their reading. And so using writing about reading to make reading visible as a way to build on what kids are already doing. The second step in our process, or another step in our process, is listening into those conversations readers are having with one another, either in their partnerships, in their clubs, or their whole class conversation, or even with you. And what, does their, what do their conversations reveal to us about their thinking patterns? And so through steps one and two, you'll find out that kids are doing a lot of thinking in their reading work. And so we wanna build on what kids are already doing, which leads us to step number three, which is the identifying phase or the identifying step in the process. So what kind of thinking are, are kids doing in their reading? And Gravity is going to talk us through a little bit of that um, in the next couple of minutes. So then the last step would be to decide. So what type of thinking do I want to teach next? So this is almost like the teaching step of the process. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that step too later on in the, in the slides. And so all of this, this, this decision making process does, like Gravity talked about earlier, kind of free up a little bit of our brain space. And it just feels nice to have something to lean on, a consistent approach to lean on so that we're not frantically scrambling, looking for, you know, the next thing to teach. Um, it helps us kind of take a big deep breath. Uh, it gives us a little bit more time to spend with students and they're kind of giving us what they need to teach. Um, and it really frees up more brain space for our teaching minds. And I think therefore it brings clarity to our teaching. And so kids ultimately benefit from having systems around this about uh, some decision-making process. So it's been working really well in the field. Um, and Gravity is going to talk a little bit next, if we want to go to the next slide. Well, Renee, about, actually, I want to yeah. say one thing. You yeah. know me. I always have something else to say. Can we go yeah. back for one second? Yeah, do it, do it. <laughs> 
So when I look at the list, like the first word, the action in each of those steps of look, listen, identify, decide, the thing that I love or one of the things I love is the only one that maybe is newer is the third. Because every sure. teacher I know is looking at their kids' work. Every teacher I know is listening to what their kids have to say, and every teacher is making decisions. So what I think like the piece that we really are going to spend a lot of time on in this webinar is the identifying from the looking and listening what is a type of thinking. And the good news, I'm going to give a preview, is there's only three. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that that's an important part to think about is often, and we'll talk about this in a few slides, we don't know what we're even looking for when we are looking and listening. So I think that's an important part is we're not adding to what teachers are doing. We're basically just helping us do it with a little more clarity, like you said. Yeah, yeah framing it, framing yep. what we're already doing. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. <laughs> so in our quest to streamline and simplify um, so that we're not making 180 decisions across 180 days, we started to look at the kinds of um, teaching points and skills that we were teaching, and we realized that we didn't need to teach 180 different skills. We actually didn't even need to teach 18 different skills, that all of the things we were teaching when it came to thinking about reading came in these four main categories, actually two categories or focus areas when we're reading fiction and two when we're reading nonfiction. Four seems so manageable, like four slices of pizza or pie or cake or whatever those places could be or in this case four pieces of a puzzle and so the two that we really focus on when we're teaching reading are students ability to understand the characters in their book and to interpret themes i'm just going to pause there for a moment because some of you might be wondering like we were but what about all those other things that we teach when do we teach those so let's try it out because that's what Renee and I did. We tested like all the skills that we were teaching and said, does it fit under either of these focus areas? So one of those might be, well, what about understanding setting? Like how does setting have an important part in the, does setting have an important role to play? And yes, but setting is only important because it's the place where characters are. <laughs> or setting is important because it's a symbol that's showing us something that has to do with the theme of the text. So it's not that we're not teaching something like setting, but it's all under the area or the focus of characters or themes. And when we were reading nonfiction, we realized all of the skills we were teaching either fell into the focus area of synthesizing information, which really what we mean by synthesis, because that word means like everything and nothing. It's such one of these, you know, fancy academic words that I feel like often can be so confusing, especially for students is we really explain it to them as synthesis is the ability to put the smaller pieces of information together to understand the whole and to come up with those bigger ideas of the whole. And so um, that is one main area that's essential when we're reading and teaching nonfiction. And the other is the ability to understand perspectives. And by perspectives, I mean our own perspective as a reader about this nonfiction topic, the author's perspective, and maybe even if we're reading this with others in our a small group or in a book club or in our class, the perspectives of others who also are thinking about this topic. And this is so important, um, not just from a reading point of view, from a citizenship point of view, the ability to be able to understand the perspectives of others and respect those. So when we think about that, an example of how other skills might fit into these categories could be something like, but what about unfamiliar content specific vocabulary? Well, that's one of the small parts that we need to teach kids to figure out in order to synthesize. But really the way that we figure out the meaning of an unfamiliar word in a nonfiction article or a book or video is by seeing how that word or that piece fits within the larger sentence or paragraph or page or context. So even that skill is really a part of synthesis. And so we've tested it and tested it, right, Renee? And so oh, far, yeah. yes, <laughs> all of the comprehension skills that we would be teaching fall into one of these four categories. And so because of that, it feels so much more manageable to either chunk our year or our units or our decisions into one of these four areas and see it that way, rather than thinking that we're planning 180 or even 18 different focus areas throughout the year. And so in our books, we, um, in the fiction book, we have a chapter on understanding characters and a chapter on interpreting themes. And in the nonfiction, we have a chapter on synthesis and understanding perspectives, 
with lots of lesson ideas of sort of if your students um, are doing X, Y, or Z, here's a lesson you might teach for that. Again, trying to streamline our decisions that we're thinking about two areas at a time in fiction and two areas at a time with nonfiction. So let's look at the next slide for what we mean by like, what are we looking for and how would we know what lessons to teach? So Renee and I are famous for walking around with clipboards. <laughs> I haven't found one that fits in my new purse yet, Renee, but you know I will because <laughs> we love to carry clipboards with us, um, not just to take notes, although that's part of it, but also to like have little sheets for ourselves of like what it is that we're looking and listening for. Um, because I found um, when I'm meeting with students in a conference or in a small group, it's easy to get distracted by everything they might need or sometimes with our really, um, really strong readers to not know what to teach them because they're doing everything we taught in the whole class lessons. And that can be really challenging also. So what we um, have done is really tried to think about what do we look for? And I have this one example here is for understanding characters, but we have one for each of those focus areas. But what we're looking at here is a clipboard um, note on what do we look for? And there's really three different types of thinking that we realize students of all levels, even adults, that we do when we're studying characters. And what this does is while we're looking at thinking, it allows us to look at thinking and not the actual book the student is holding when we don't know the book. Because probably after, I don't know what to teach tomorrow, the second um, most pr um, prevalent question or comment that teachers say is, how do I know what to teach if I haven't read their book? And I totally get how that can be really a huge shift for a lot of us. And so instead, one way to think about it is we're not teaching the book, we're teaching kids how to think about, in this case, characters. So what we're listening for or looking for is the type of thinking. And there's three main types, like I said, right now thinking, over time thinking, and refining thinking. And what we've done, and this is an example of a page right from the book, is we've put what you can look for and what a reader might say on here so that when you are looking and listening, like Brene mentioned in the steps in the decision-making process, you kind of have some ideas of what that could be. But I want to use the next slide to make this less theoretical and a lot more practical and understandable. So one of the things that Renee and I love to do is relate um, reading skills to everyday life skills. And so this was inspired by reminiscing to, oh gosh, well over a decade ago when we were single living in New York City and we were dating. And so the three types of thinking that we do when we think about characters are just like the three types of thinking we do when we think about people in our lives. So let's start with right now thinking. So right now thinking is when we're thinking about characters or people, but we're only basing our thinking on what's happening right now in the moment of the text or the experience. So it might sound like this. Imagine you're on a first date and you're thinking this. I love this guy, he is so sweet. He's talking about his mom with such love and adoration. So you can see, right, Renee, right? It's just this one <laughs> moment when he's talking about his yep. mom. Now, overtime thinking is when we're basing our thinking not just on this one moment, but on a pattern of what's happened before in the text. So even if we're on like, you know, page 36, we're not just thinking about page 36, we're thinking about all those 36 pages. Or maybe we've been dating a few weeks and now we're thinking about all of those dates over those few weeks and our thinking might sound like this. He is so sweet and also a bit of a mama's boy. <laughs> it's great he loves his mom so much and talks about her a lot and goes on vacations with her and eats dinner there almost every night. <laughs> so you can see this kind of thinking is based on multiple experiences, and if this was characters, it would be like multiple parts of the text. And the third type of thinking is what we call refining thinking. And this would be now, it's been a month in dating, and it's not necessarily, it, yes, it can combine right now and over time, but it's a, your willingness to revise your thinking or be more specific or even change your mind. So now it might sound like this. He is so immature and needy. It's like he wants me to be his mom. I need someone who is independent and can make choices on his own. Loving your family is important, but so is being your own person. Last date for sure. <laughs> so you can see how the thinking changed. You know, I put it in you know, bold from he is so sweet, but also a bit of a mama's boy to immature and needy. And I think it's easy to see when we look at examples from dating or 
in our lives that this is the same kind of thinking that we want students to be able to do when they're thinking about characters in books. That the ability to think right now about a character, but also accumulate information across the text to form an idea, but also be willing to refine or revise or even change your mind if needed. And um, by explaining it even to students as right now over time and refining, they can understand that concept. But it also, again, going back to thin slicing, it helps us know what are we looking for. So when we go back to that four step decision making process, remember step one was look, step two was listen, but step three is the one we're talking about on this slide, like deciding on their current type of thinking. And so I can look and listen and say, are they thinking mostly right now about the character over time about the character, or are they really refining their thinking about the character? And before I decide what to teach, I want to know what type of thinking they're doing right now about um, the character so I know where to go next. So we're going to spend the next few slides showing you some student examples and kind of taking you through and showing you how we go through that process. But basically, let's all remember those three right now over time and refining and Renee is going to take us to the next slide and try it out. That feels really nice gravity it feels really clear. <laughs> Um, but now I am thinking about dating stories, but I'm going to move my brain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look. We've got um, Michelle's uh, notebook entry here, and I want to start thinking about, uh, you know, applying our four-step process. Um, and so we don't have Michelle here with us, so we can, though, take a look at her work. And thinking about what is she already doing in this notebook um, that we can see and perhaps get to that identity phase of I'm thinking about right now over time or refining. And so it's interesting what I see, Michelle, she does have a system for organizing herself. She's got a chart made here. Um, she's got some sketches and it looks like she's also even imagining what those characters are saying. You can say, hey, losers, gulp, come on, Willow. And so she looks like she's like, a, she's got, she sees them in her mind and she's imagining what they might see on the left-hand side through her quick sketch and even some of her dialogue. And on the right-hand side, she's thinking about what that character who looks like Willow is doing right there in the moment, right? Willow doesn't want to try her magic. Um, it looks like on the bottom, she's also looking at another character, right? Just Lucinda, who I think mm -hmm. is Willow's sister by her parenthetical thought there. Mm -hmm. um, and Lucinda's nerve, she's in the situation and she's like kind of being nervous about ironically a boyfriend coming over. Um, <laughs> so she's fussing over her, her dinner. Um, so, Gravity, thinking about what you just took us through, it seems like Michelle is in the moment, right? She's doing some right now thinking because she's got the two characters don't seem connected on, on this notebook entry. She's kind of thinking mm -hmm. a little bit about Willow in a particular scene and then a little bit about Lucinda in a particular scene. So she understands it, right? But it seems like mm -hmm. it's like right now in that in that particular scene kind of on the page. Yeah, and when I'm looking at this, Brene, too, so her teacher modeled how to set up a t-shirt but she chose to use it and she chose okay. these categories right so i think that also gives us like we know she's looking at things like you said right and mm -hmm. we know she's thinking so this isn't like a graphic organizer that her teacher told her to fill out so that's why we know she is having these thoughts but i see what you're saying it seems like it's just she's not basing this on the past at all it's just what's happening like right now in the text yeah right? And I don't, yeah. and I we I don't necessarily I don't know fourth grade fairy, but I can learn a lot by looking at this notebook entry and what she's done in it. Mm -hmm. um, right, because even if we haven't read the book, we know what we're looking for one of those three types of thinking. I mean, it seems like she's not refining or thinking or looking over time. It's like right now, what's happening? So let's take a look at the next slide. Yep. So these charts we put all in the book, this is a, a photograph from one of sort of breaking that down into like, what is it that the reader said or wrote? And then what do we notice about that and what type of thinking? And this is what we agreed on, what we thought was it was right now thinking because she's thinking about the character's feelings in one scene, right? And she's thinking about each of these characters and what's motivating them, but as separate, not of how they necessarily are relating to one another. And so one of the things I just want to keep pointing out that I know you mentioned too, Renee, is we're starting from strengths. And um, those who are listening who read Mindsets and Moves know that's you know, all the research of how important it is to first look at what students are doing before we go to what to do next. So before we even do that decision about where we're going, like you said, we know she's doing right now thinking. 
And in just a few slides, we will show you how do we decide the next part, but we don't want to skip through the identify because this is the crucial part sort of of everything in the four step process. So let's look at another student example on the next slide. So this is a middle school student and I am going to read this in case some people are having trouble sort of seeing her entry. I'm going to quickly read it for us and show you how we go about figuring out again and understanding characters, the kind of thinking she's doing. So she, this, this student is reading Divergent, one of my favorites, and this is what she wrote. This is how I think Tris would look because of the descriptions in the book. She was part of the abnegation faction, so her face is very plain and simple. She has brown hair, which is wavy. Her eyes are described as stunning and mesmerizing. She's a very confident individual, so I did my best to portray that in my design. She's very beautiful but mysterious, which is what I believe makes her so relatable. I also believe that her being so different from everyone creates an aura which everyone is naturally attracted to. Being divergent is described as dangerous, but I would think it would be fun to be different from the societal norms. So I was a little bit distracted by the words aura and societal norms, so she's using <laughs> some very precise words. Um, I need a little more information, so luckily we got to listen to her talk to her partner. And I'm going to read a little bit of this transcript so we can also hear what she said. So we're looking and then we're listening. So Margaret is the student whose work we just looked at. And Margaret says to her partner, Olivia, have you read Divergent yet? And Olivia, yes. I read the first book twice and the others in the series once. Margaret, well, I was picturing what Tris looks like and I drew it here. Olivia, I pictured her really pretty and tall too. Margaret, really? But the author says she's in the abnegation faction and they're really plain, kind of like Amish people. I pictured her pretty, but super plain, like no makeup and no jewelry and her hair is natural and long. Olivia, I guess you're right. I was thinking more about how she looked later in the book because she changes and Margaret, stop. Don't tell me what happens. I'm not done yet. And I love how Olivia smiles and nods. Veronica Roth, that's the author, says that Tris is divergent later on in the book, and that did make me picture her differently. Like she was plain, and also her eyes must look different, and the way she moves might be different. Like I pictured her moving faster and more graceful than the others in her faction. I couldn't draw her moving in this entry, but it was like I saw her like a dancer and more playful than the others in her faction. So first of all, I love that she stops her friend from telling her the ending. <laughs> um, but when I'm looking and listening together, and that's why it's so nice when we can do both to have both kinds of information, it doesn't seem like she's just thinking about one moment in time right now with this character, that she's thinking about when she was in this one faction, the abnegation, and then later on how she's in this divergent. And those are two different scenes and different parts of the text. And you can even see how she's, she shares with her partner how her thinking changed. Um, and how we're thinking sort of developed. So she's definitely not doing right now thinking, um, but I also don't see like a big idea emerging of like a really refined idea. So it seems like she's still thinking over time about the character. Do you wanna look at that chart, Renee, and, and talk a little more about that? Yeah, so let's go to the next side. And okay. as, I, as I listen to you, Gravity, it seems like this is not necessarily all the cases, but a lot of times when kids are doing right now thinking, it's often in a scene and sometimes can sound like a recall, right? Or an mm, image. Yep, and it feels yep. like the difference between these new these two readers is that she really does have a theory built about this character or her own thinking or an idea and her description um, that sometimes comes out in over time thinking. And even uh, you know, with the boyfriend example too, like to get kids into refining seems like they really are in big idea work. Um, mm -hmm. And so that could not always the case, but just that struck me when we kind of compared these two mm -hmm. readers together, that if you look at this chart, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to show in this chart is our thinking work as teachers when we get to look and listen. So this, this thinking kind of capture this chart kind of captures our thinking in the identity stage of our four step process. Um, I, I, the identify stage you're saying, right? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the identify stage yeah. and our four-step process. And so you can see by together looking at that reading notebook and listening to the partnership conversation, we have more information to assess the reader and kind of get a better sense mm -hmm. of the type of thinking she's doing is over time because she's able to come, you know, put things together. Yep. 
we're not necessarily saying you have to create these charts, of course, unless you, of course, want to and find it helpful. But I can imagine if you were working with a coach or a colleague um, or even like a whole staff PD situation, these charts might be interesting to take to your group to study together mm -hmm. just to kind of um, practice and take yourself through, like give yourself permission to have like an exercise together to think through just like what does it sound like? What does it feel like to look and listen? Um, what does it feel like to identify um, and then move into the next stage, which is the teach phase. Yep. So now that we've had a, two practices and shown people how we do look, listen, and identify, you want to go to the next slide and show them the decide the three choices? Sure. So thinking about that fourth step is, okay, I need to decide what to teach next. Um, Gravity and I, again, spent a lot of hours looking at our own teaching, and we found some patterns. So we thought a little bit um, to share those patterns with you. So we call this part the three teaching choices we can make. And again, you want to think about the first word in each of these sentences, name, show, and coach. So really, when I go through this four-step process, some of your readers might benefit from the type of teaching where I'm naming and reinforcing just by basically telling the readers and encouraging them, this is what you're doing. Did you know what you're, did you know that you're doing this? And I know in my life when I'm learning new things, I often don't know why, mm -hmm. what and why I'm doing. Like when Gravity and I trained for triathlon, I don't know how I got across the pool, but it was helpful <laughs> to have Gravity say something like, I think you got across the pool because you had your arm straight. So a lot of times it's really helpful to have someone name for you what you're doing, especially when you're new or just need a little bit of encouragement when you're taking on a new skill set. And Renee, it's interesting you say that because just today when I was talking to another Corwin author, Patty McGee, she was saying it's the difference between something being like incidental versus intentional. Like when somebody names it for you, then you can make it intentional. And so many of our students are doing things sort of incidentally or accidentally, right? Yeah. So when we name it for them, they can own it in a way that then they can choose to do it again. And I think that's so helpful that we're not always thinking we need to teach something brand new to every reader. Absolutely. So the next time I swam, I kept my arm straight, right? Because I right. <laughs> named it for me, right? Um, the idea of showing readers is something I know a lot of us do. Showing is where we invite kids into our procedural, almost like our how-to, watch how I do this skill. Um, and then the third type of teaching your kids might benefit from, your readers might benefit from, are coaching your readers to apply um, a strategy in another part of the book or maybe even in another book. So those students, those readers are, um, you know, almost like using but confusing strategies, right, to use that phrase, but thinking like they just need some help or they really are really good at applying a skill in one part of the book and they need you to coach them to try it in other parts of the book. So name, show, and coach, um, we thought are helpful to think about, I have three choices when it comes to teaching, to, again, to eliminate um, you know, frantically trying to think about how will I teach this, I'm either going to name and reinforce, I'm going to show in a procedural, like kind of step by step, or I'm going to coach kids or almost remind kids how to kind of mm -hmm. take this on. And Renee, most of the teachers that I work with do all three, and that's another reason why conferences go so long, or they're so tired at the end of the day, right? So we're trying right. to like, not that people need our permission, but let people know, like, it's rare we would do all of these things. We pick one. Um, and sometimes we don't know when we just go with the one that our gut tells us, right? We like do a quick little thin slice and we say, I think they don't need to learn something new right now. I'm going to name it for them. Or they've been doing the same thing for a while and now I want to show them something else, right? So it could be, in absolutely. So it could be interesting to think about if you looked back on your day today, not only a lot of you are sharing with us the decisions you're making and even decisions you're having for dinner tonight, but the idea of what kind of teaching did your teaching fall into do you you can probably have you probably have a story of naming for a student or showing or coaching and it could be interesting tomorrow to think about making a plan like which students in your class need which type of teaching so that you aren't exhausted by the end of the day because you're making really intentional decisions mm -hmm. exactly so, so we're, get, we're gonna invite you into a classroom right gravity we're gonna see natalia yes so that's the next slide so um, we're going to watch um, Renee and I working with Natalia. And just to be super clear, Renee and I do not often get to work two teachers and one student in a conference, but that's what you get to see here. Um, and it's not a full on teaching conference. It's really an opportunity that we were just doing the first two steps in this clip 
of looking at a notebook entry um, of Natalia's that she had chosen to write and then talking to her and listening to what she had to say about her thinking. So we're going to um, ask all of you to do those first three steps with us of looking with us and listening to what she had to say. And we're going to ask everyone to think about what are the types of thinking that you think she's mostly doing. Is she mostly thinking right now about the characters, over time about the characters, or is she even refining her thinking about the characters? And I'm going to ask you to take a little bit of a risk and write what you think in the chat button. And again, only Renee and I see it, and we will have no judgment at all because there isn't a right answer to this. It's whatever your teacher gut instinct is showing. So we're going to watch the first few minutes of this and um, get a peek into Natalia, a third grader, and her thinking about um, what's the cat book called? Bad Renee? Kitty. Bad, Bad Kitty. Kitty. Thank you. We're going to get to see her with Bad Kitty. So some of you are writing in the, oh, 
So in the chat feature, some of you are writing down what you think the type of thinking is that she was mostly doing. So I'll just give everybody another 10 or 15 seconds um, to see what type. So remember, it was, is she thinking just right now on this one moment of the text? Is she thinking over time across multiple parts of the text? Or do you think she has a thought that she's sort of coming back to and revisiting and trying to refine? So we'll give everybody a moment and it seems like can we go to the next slide? That might be helpful too to see. Yes. Thank you, Renee. So we looked and listened. So you're thinking about what did you notice she said? And then we're going to name what it is that we think she's currently doing, the type of thinking, and then decide where to go next. So by looking at um, the chat, it seems like most people think she's doing some overtime, overtime thinking. Yeah. Yep. Because she wasn't just talking about this one part of Bad Kitty. She was like, well, Bad Kitty is doing this and Bad Kitty, you know, like she was seeing there was a pattern about Bad Kitty. Um, and so because of that, then we have, of course, the final question. So what do we teach next? Do we name that for her? Like you're doing some thinking across time or over time about this character. And here's how you're doing that. Or... Um, do we show her how to refine her thinking? Because that's a type that she wasn't doing a lot of. Um, or do we show her how to do that same kind of thinking in a whole other text? So, I mean, it's a little bit of a judgment call, right, Renee? It's like whatever our gut is telling us and knowing Natalia of what we would do. So luckily, when we decide, if it's, especially if it's showing, like what, how to show a student what to do next, we have um, a bunch of lessons in the book that help people sort of know, like if I wanna show them another type of thinking, what that might be. So maybe let's go to the next slide to show an example of that. So here's just one lesson that we were thinking about if we wanted to show um, Natalia another type of thinking, which is thinking more about the dynamics between characters. And so this is um, a screenshot of two of the pages and all the lessons are one to two pages, really short and explicit, because again, we don't want you having to do a ton of time, like, you know, going through pages and pages to decide what to teach. And there's this white part that says thin slice to decide to teach this tomorrow if you're students. And we tried to put this feature in and it's in every lesson so that you're also figuring out does this match what my students need next. And so we were thinking this could be an example of teaching her since she knows how to think over time about the bad kitty, could we get her to also um, think about the dynamics between characters, and that's something we could show her um, in one of our books. And this is just one of dozens and dozens of lessons that we have um, organized by those four major skills of characters and themes, and then in nonfiction um, synthesis and understanding perspective. And it feels like gravity, it feels fun to think of a little bit about that there are going to be students in your classroom who will benefit from each of the three types of teaching. Mm -hmm. and so that could be interesting to think about every year you're going to have students who are going to react to different kinds of teaching and um, in different text types and different genres. And so that is really interesting to give yourself permission um, to really think strategically about which students in which type of teaching. Absolutely. You know, like Natalia was, was very open and she's like very much willing to let us show her another type or to some students might be more hesitant and maybe want us to name what they're already doing in that teaching moment and sort of build up their self-confidence and their willingness to take a risk with something new. We might not do that early on like we, we, we would with Natalia. And the big thing I want to just say now, more for myself than even just for everyone else, is there's not a wrong decision mm -hmm. that is based <laughs> on the student that you're sitting with right now. Like the only wrong decision would be teaching something because someone told you to that doesn't match your students. But if it's based on something you noticed in your students, then there's not a wrong way to go. So I think that just helps me to sleep every night when I'm still second guessing myself is knowing it's based on what I looked and listened to and the type of thinking that was my best gut instinct and thin slice. So I'm gonna go with it and trust myself. And say I've spent a lot of well-earned hours with those students, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> which, which are going to help you improvise and and kind of help you with that gut, that teacher's gut instinct. Absolutely. So we only have a few minutes left, Renee, which we knew would happen, even though we have so much to say. So maybe we can go to the next slide and let them know a little bit of like what we didn't get to talk about, but wanted to let people know exists. Absolutely. So this is only the beginning. This is only the beginning. We, we want to continue studying with you more. Um, and so join us. There's lots of ways that you can join us. You, if 
there's a lot more to what we talked about today um, in our book series. So we've got lesson ideas, we've got more videos, lots of Gravity and I take you into a lot, a lot of videos. Um, there's great places to start in terms of if you're sitting thinking, hmm, how do I get more student conversation going up? Somebody in the, in the chat panel talked a little bit about having multiple entry points. So having some reading, writing about reading and some conversations. So there's help in the book um, in the book series to think about getting reading notebooks up and going and getting really particular classroom conversations coming up. So we have lots of lessons, lots of videos, um, and some great clipboard notes that you can replicate and try out and give us your feedback. Um, so please join us in thinking a little bit more and then we'd love to know um, how it's going. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So if you think a little bit about what, what's your 48 hour plan, so to speak, you know, thinking about, um, you know, some of you might, you might have a lot, some of this might have felt confirming to you thinking about, okay, I've got a lot of this happening in my classroom, what's my next step. Um, hopefully some of you found an entry point somewhere today um, in thinking about what you want to think about with your students and your colleagues back at your site. So if you could leave us in the chat box something that you're thinking about that you're either going to study personally with a colleague or you already know some students on your roster that you're going to start a conversation with tomorrow. And while that's happening, go ahead and get to, we can go to the next slide. So, um, Renee and I are both on social media and we would love to hear feedback from all of you and keep in touch with different ideas of what's going on in your classroom and we always share examples of what's going on in the classrooms we're lucky enough to go into. So one is that we do have a website, that's www.gravityandrenee.com. We also, you can use that hashtag um, on Twitter and you can also follow each of us on Twitter and we're pretty active on there. We participate in chats and we tweet resources and ideas and I'm guessing a lot of you maybe even found this webinar that way. And um, an example on the right hand side are just some of the recent posts that we have on our blog and all of our blog ideas from, come from questions from teachers. So feel free to contact us through the website or tweet at us or put a comment here in the chat about what do you wanna hear more about that we didn't maybe get enough time to talk about today and that will probably be one of our upcoming blogs. And some of our blogs are also video blogs. So um, a lot of times we'll answer questions, especially when we can get together live with one another um, through making a quick home video and answering you that way. So stay tuned for videos and uh, or uh, more traditional blogs that answer some of the questions that you have. And thanks and, for all your big ideas. The big ideas are great that you're writing about. It's gonna sound exciting to be in your classrooms tomorrow. Absolutely, we're looking at, um, people are wondering, a K-2 book, yes, we just need more time to finish writing it. Um, um, and we're, I'm loving getting to see the comments and probably too many than we have time to address right now. Um, Perhaps even a high school book. Somebody's thinking about their work with high school students too. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm pushing Renee for that one too. So we just, we just need the time in the day because we are in classrooms almost every day. Um, but since our time, speaking of time, is almost up, we want to thank you so much for taking this hour for your own professional learning, um, for being the kinds of teachers who want to constantly outgrow yourselves in the best interest of your students. And hopefully also, if nothing else, I hope you're leaving tonight thinking about how you can trust your gut just a little bit more and how you might be able to streamline your decisions um, to have one less decision to make tonight. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Hi, so this is Rebecca Eaton, and I just wanted to thank everybody for coming to this wonderful uh, webinar. Weren't Gravity and Renee fabulous? Um, I just love listening to them. And I wanted to let you know that um, there are two titles, What Do I Teach Readers? Tomorrow, Fiction and Nonfiction are both available at um, corwin.com slash literacy. Uh, they're normally priced at $33.95. But at Core and Literacy, we offer a 20% everyday educator discount. So anytime you want to purchase a book with, uh, through Core and Literacy, you will always get a 20% discount, which puts these books at $27.95. Um, of course, you can also find these books with your favorite distributor or a wholesaler. Um, if you prefer to purchase through Amazon, um, they're, they're available everywhere. Uh, next slide, please. 
And they, Gravity and Renee are available for consulting. And you can learn more um, by visiting our website, um, www.coren.com literacy. Uh, and they, I, you know, they're fabulous, as you can tell. And they are in classrooms all over uh, the United States sharing their wonderful ideas. So thank you again, everyone, for participating. And we'll be sending um, all of you an email within a couple of days with a link to this webinar so that you can share it with other people. Feel free to distribute it. You can watch it again yourself. You can uh, go back to your favorite slide and maybe remember, uh, remember something that you may have forgotten a couple of days from now. So uh, thank you again.